So if you're coming in on the live stream, there is a chat window where you can put in your questions. Um, if you're having trouble with the chat window, you can text me. I think Becky's sent through my mobile number, so I'll manage those and I will ask your questions for you in that, in that follow-up session. Um, now the last thing is I would quite like to have a quick session at the very end with the breeders on our sheep forum for this year. So if you've got any ideas that you'd like for the forum, that we could have a quick whiteboard session and capture those. So without any further ado, I'll introduce John McEwen. Thank you, John. Thanks, Eleanor, and uh, welcome to everybody to, to today's events. Um, this event is uh, basically taking advantage of the sheep and goat researchers that have come to the World Congress of Genetics Applied to Livestock Breeding that was held in Auckland last week. There was about 1,240 participants from around the world. And we've been pretty lucky that a number of uh, sheep and goat uh, breeders have come down to visit at Invermay after this, and we've encouraged them to give a talk today. Um, the first speaker is Noreen McHugh. She's a senior scientist at Chagas in Ireland, based in Cork, and uh, she's uh, doing a number of uh, quite interesting uh, research experiments, including evaluating our New Zealand sheep. Okay, Noreen. Thanks, John. So thanks, everyone, and thanks for the invite. Uh, it's great to talk to some New Zealand farmers for a change. Um, so I'm just going to give you a very quick whistle-stop tour of what we're doing in Ireland um, in terms of breeding. Um, just to start out, I, yeah, as John said, I work for an organisation called Chaga, so we're very similar to Ag Research, uh, very applied science, basically trying to increase profitability and productivity within our sheep sector. Um, so just to start off, a very quick uh, summary of what, what's the Irish sheep industry, what it looks like. So we have a national yo flock of about 2.6 million yos, um, so relatively small compared to New Zealand standards. Numbers have been on the increase in the last number of years. Lamb prices have been good, um, and there has been, um, really it's existing farmers that have been increasing their yo flock size. So of the 2.6 million, it supports about 35,000 Farm, far, family farms in Ireland. So it is a very important industry uh, within Ireland, especially within rural Ireland. In terms of production systems, we have two main production systems. Uh, we have lowland flocks, which account for the vast majority of the flocks. About 75% of our flocks are lowland. When I say lowland, um, they probably are on more marginal land. Um, as we head to the west coast of, coast of Ireland, our uh, soil type disimproves and land type also disimproves, and that's where most of our sheep population is. We also have hill flocks, which account for about 25% of the total yo flock. Again, a very important uh, industry in Ireland. Um, so our hill flocks are very similar to what you think about when you think about Scotland. So our yos there are very, don't rarely see grass. It's, much a, it's more a heather um, and a hair-based diet that they're on, so it's a, it's a tough environment for them. Average flock size is about uh, 107 yos at the minute, and like I said, that's increasing slightly um, over the last number of years. The main breeds that we use in Ireland um, are the Suffolk, Texel, and Charlie. So similar, I suppose, in terms of what breeds you use here. The main difference in Ireland to New Zealand is we use these terminal type yos as our maternal or our yo type. So when you look at your soft tax here, that's really our, that sprickle type yo is our base yo in Ireland. So we have a very terminal focused yo, and as you can imagine, our prolific prolificity levels um, aren't great because of that. We have high prolific maternal type yos. The Belle Claire is one example. Um, it uh, has a high weaning rate, lots of milk, but just getting our farmers to buy into a maternal type yo is, is a tough message for us to sell. So we wean at approximately about 130% in Ireland, and we'd like to see that move. It hasn't shifted in the last 30 years, unfortunately. In terms of sheep prices, this is just to highlight the prices from the various countries for the last year. Um, if you look in green here, that's Ireland. So you can see we're very similar to the average price that they get in the UK as well. So last year, uh, our price was about uh, four, four euro sixty uh, per per, car per kilo of carcass. 
So it's equivalent to about of $150 uh, was the average price we got for lambs in Ireland last year. And like I said, our lamb prices have been good for the last number of years, which has led to a good bit of buoyancy in our industry. You can see yourselves, you're down here in the purple line, so you fall uh, quite behind what we're getting in Europe. And France obviously lead the way when it comes to sheep prices in Europe. So that's just a quick stop um, of the industry, but I'm happy to take questions afterwards if you want more detail on our industry. So now I really want to focus on our breeding program in Ireland. Uh, so the breeding program we operate in Ireland, um, well, I suppose go through the breeding structure at the minute. We have pedigree or purebred breeders at the top. So there are stud breeders. And unlike um, New Zealand, most of these uh, breed purebred animals and want to keep them pure. So they're 100% uh, of, of the chosen breed very small part of our of our industry um, and then we have the commercial farmers down below so um, we have no multiplier like you would have here it's, it's just a two-way pyramid that we have in Ireland in terms of our breeding program and what this means so this accounts for probably 95 percent of our farmers in Ireland this is five percent of our sheep farmers in Ireland but when we look at our breeding program and where we're getting our information to uh, generate indexes from the vast majority of it comes from this pedigree sector. So about 80% of the data we have at the minute uh, within our indexes um, is coming from our pedigree flocks. So how they record, we have a scheme run through Sheep Ireland, which is the equivalent of SIL in Ireland. Uh, they run through a scheme called LAM Plus. Those RAMs obviously are evaluated. Indexes are generated for them. Them RAMs flow down into our commercial uh, population and obviously they flow back up as well um, into the pedigree population. So this is something we're very conscious of. All our data or the vast majority of our data at the minute is coming from the purebred, um, the purebred sector. And in Ireland, the purebred sector, a lot of people feed, still feed large amounts of concentrates. The show ring is still important for some breeders as well. So uh, we, we in our breeding scheme are very focused on this, on breeding the right animal for our commercial population. So more and more of our information in the future is going to come from that commercial population. So at the minute where we're getting this commercial information, it's from our CPT, so very similar scheme to what you run here in, our, in New Zealand. We have just, at the minute, we've actually five commercial flocks. They have about three and a half thousand yos between those flocks. Uh, we have planned matings, bringing the rams from this lamb plus, plus scheme down into a commercial flock where we're me measuring them under very commercial, uh, ex more extensive um, systems. And the matings are obviously to provide genetic linkage between all our breeds, so very similar to what you do here in, in New Zealand. Also, as part of my organization, we have a number of commercial flocks. We have about 30 commercial flocks that are part of what we call a better, uh, the Better Farm Scheme, so it's really to impre improve profitability through new technology. And one of the technologies we're obviously using here is genetics. So they are all single sire mated or using DNA parentage, so we have a lot of information coming from these farms as well. So just to go through then the indexes, so all that information from the breeding program flows into what we call Sheep Ireland. So like I said, the equivalent of SIL here in New Zealand. Uh, they've been in operation since 2008, so we're a relatively new breeding scheme for sheep in Ireland. We produce two breeding objectives, which I'll go through in a minute. And we give each animal a euro value or a profit value. So it's basically to show how much more profitable that animal, that ram, will be on your flock. We also have a tool that we use for commercial farmers, uh, which is the star ratings of the, la of the ram. So this is very similar to the hotel scheme. If you're a five-star ram, you're in the top 20% of animals for that given trait or that given index. One star are the poor genetic animals they're in the bottom 20%. And the reason we have this is because when you think about our flock size, we're only at about 100 yos. Most, uh, most farmers are going out to buy a ram maybe once every three or four years. So to keep an eye on this Eurostar value, what's at the top might be, uh, might, it's a hard job for them to remember the actual Eurostar value they should be going after. The five stars is a very easy tool for them to remember. So in terms of breeding objectives, then we have two breeding objectives we select on, a terminal and a replacement, okay? So very similar to what you operate here. Um, and just to go through what we actually include in these indexes at the minute. So in the terminal, first thing we look at is lambing. Uh, so we measure lambing difficulty and lamb survival. So lambing difficulty is measured in every O that lambs down. 
And the reason we can do this is because most of our flocks are lambing indoors. So they know if they have to handle each yo. So we have a record on individual animals for that. Um, so they're very important traits. Growth, obviously, when you think of thermally, you think of growth and carcass. So we have growth in there, and a good bit of our emphasis goes on growth. So we use a trait called days to slaughter. Very easy understood by our commercial farmers again. Um, the less or the, the lower the EBV or the breeding value for days to slaughter, the quicker those animals are going to get off your farm, the higher the growth rates. We also have meat in there. Carcass fat and confirmation is included. And we've also this year added in health traits because health, like any other country, is a major problem with sheep in Ireland. At the minute, we have lameness, which is a big problem in Ireland, and DAG score to account for fly strike. Fecal egg count and mastitis are the next ones, hopefully, to come in next year. The replacement side of things, um, then we select firstly on yo traits, so that's milk yield, number of lambs born, and yo weight. So we are actually penalizing our yo's uh, for mature size because remember, most of our yo's is a terminal type yo. She's a big yo, she's up 80 to 100 kilo, depending on your breed. So we want to reduce those yo size if we can, while hold, obviously increasing growth rate. Lambing obviously is important. The yo has a big effect on this as well. So we record lambing difficulty and survival as well on the yo. We also include meat and growth in our uh, replacement index because not only do we want a good fertile milky yo, we want her to be able to produce um, a good carcass or a good weaned animal. So meat and, car meat and growth traits are also included in there. And obviously health is just as important on the O side as on the RAM side. So we have lameness and DAG score included in there as well. So each RAM in Ireland gets both these indexes because a RAM can be chosen, the same type of RAM could be chosen to be used to produce your replacements or be, ch be chosen to become a terminal type sire. So each RAM has two indexes. So that's really a quick snapshot of where we are. If we look at what our role in terms of Sheep Ireland or myself in Chagas, what's our plan for the next five years? Um, the first thing we want, to look, we want to try and do is improve the rate of genetic gain. Our genetic gain is relatively low, especially by New Zealand standards. We're gaining about 30 cent per lamb per year. We'd like to lift that massively. Um, the other big problem with our scheme in Ireland is the, the accuracy levels that we see associated with our individual indexes is still quite low. So the average ram lamb which is sold in Ireland has an accuracy of between 30 and 40 percent. What that means is a commercial farmer is going out, he's probably paid more money for these five star animals, uh, but that five star, what he bought on paper one day could suddenly be a two star the next day because the information behind him, there's not a huge amount of information because we sell them as ram lambs. So we definitely want to improve this accuracy figure um, and improve farmers' confidence then in the index. How we're going to do it, the two ways we see doing it is improving our genetic evaluations and genomic selection, and then index validation, or actually getting our farmers to believe in these actual star ratings or in selecting these animals with higher genetics. So genomic selection, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. I don't really need to bring you through it. What our procedure is at the minute in Ireland, we uh, prefer to tag the lambs at birth. Like I said, we lamb indoors, so we can do this. So we take a sample of the, of, from the ear tissue. It's linked to our um, national identification tag um, at birth. Send the results to the, la to the lab. They do all their magic tricks. We get the results back this stage, the lamb's still only dreaming of being this five-star ram. Um, and this is why we are interested in genomic section for Ireland. We reckon that um, we will know, obviously, lots of DNA of the animal at a very young age, before this uh, animal is a couple of months of age. If we can increase the accuracy uh, from that 30 to 40 percent um, up anyway at all, I think we'll be helping our industry. But if we look at the dairy scenario where we have genomic selection up and running, if we were to get to the heights of there, our ram lambs being sold would have an accuracy of almost uh, 80%. So if we get, get as high as that, uh, we definitely improve uh, the genetic gain we're seeing. We reckon if it's the equivalent of this lamb, which is again only a couple of days old or a couple of months old, having the equivalent of uh, 16 progeny himself on the ground for a 
for a highly heritable trait, so something like carcass information. For a lowly heritable trait, so something like uh, those health traits I talked about, it's the equivalent of having records on 180 of his lambs. So again, it has massive uh, implications for our industry if we can get this up and running. So with that in mind, we went out to our government and looked for money to actually start this genomic selection process. So we were lucky enough to get about uh, a million euro um, off our Department of Agriculture to do a research scheme uh, to try and launch genomic selection. So what we did is we visited all our pedigree flocks, or we offered to visit all our pedigree flocks in the last two years, 15 and 16. Um, and we offered to take a DNA sample uh, of every breeding yo and breeding ram that was on that flock on that day. Um, so at the minute, that allowed us to collect information on 18,000 animals. So we just used tags, our own tags, uh, where we collected the, the uh, sample of the year. It was completely free uh, for all our breeders. So we did this free of charge. Obviously, we were out visiting all these flocks, and we said, well, this is a great opportunity to collect lots of information. So on every animal we took a sample from, we DAG scored the animal, we took a lameness measurement, and in all the O's we also measured mastitis. And that allowed us to get our new health sub-index and hopefully we'll have mastitis in there next year because we said great opportunity to collect information on all these animals. So we have all this information and believe it or not, genomic selection is not the way we're selling this new DNA uh, technology to our breeders, we're selling it and all the add-on benefits that they can get uh, from it. Uh, so the first thing that the air breeders are interested in, we talk about DNA, is the population structure, is how related are their breeds and also how pure purebred are their breeds or how pure are their breeds. So this is um, just an example of the population structure. Each of these colours represents a different breed in Ireland. And our, breeder, or our breeders find this fascinating as to how related all our breeds are. So just to show you quickly, we have two long wool breeds here. As you'd expect, they're very closely related at DNA level. That's the two, the blue face and the border lester. The Suffolk is quite unrelated to some of the other breeds. The two French breeds that are used widely in Ireland here, Charlie and Vendine, quite closely related. We have the Belclair breed, which is a composite, that ha composite highly prolific breed here. Um, interestingly, it lies close to another one of our native breeds called the Galway, and it also lies very close to the Texel um, and Beltex breeds. So again, this is just information we give back to breeders just to show them how we can use this DNA technology. Um, the other big benefit of DNA technology, and this is how we're going to sell it in the future, um, to get farmers to put their hands in their pocket, or stud breeders to put their hands in their pockets and actually start to pay for this themselves as parentage. So first of all, we wanted to show them that parentage is a problem, even in our stud breeding animals, um, and to show them the benefits of it. So if we look at the first cohort of animals we genotyped, we genotyped about 13,000. And remember, they were yews and rams that were present on the farm at the time. So obviously, all of them, their mothers or fathers, weren't still in the flock. But um, we had a look to see how many of them had a parent, so had the yo and her sire was still there, or the yo and her dam was still in the flock. So about half of them, 5,000 of them, had a parent genotyped as well. On the sires we looked at it, we found that of the sires of these animals, about 10% of them were incorrect, which was surprising to us because a lot of these are using AI, or single sire maiden. So that was interesting. The other side, on the dam side, 8% of them were incorrect. And again, remember these are indoor lambing systems, the lambs are matched to the yo straight away at birth, so this is relatively high. And where both are wrong, it was about 2%. Okay, so roughly uh, they are cumulative. Our, our parental average or our parentage hours in our stud flock is about 15%, depending on breed. Okay, so it's, it's relatively high um, for these breeders. So we've started to generate reports. Uh, for individual breeders, so they can go in and see an individual animal. So I've highlighted an animal here. This is a male ram bo born in 2016. His sire is recorded here. We can see it's a match, so yeah, parentage is verified. And on the dam side, it's verified as well. So all this information is available through a website. Uh, so Sheep Ireland um, have a, a website where each farmer can log in, or each pedigree breeder has their own profile, and they can log in and see reports like this. 
So that's the benefits um, of genomic selection. So again, just, just to show you, this is, um, this is a summary of um, an animal that would appear in a sales catalogue um, in Ireland. So most of our rams are still uh, sold through livestock auctions. Some are sold on farms, but a vast majority are probably still sold through livestock auctions. So for each livestock auction, we get a, you get a report like this or a catalogue like this on each individual animal. Um, so here's the animal's ID, the pedigree name of the animal, date of birth, breed, sex, uh, birth type, um, then the ancestry information, which is obviously of information to some, some of our stud breeders. And this is how we display the indexes to uh, the farmers. So like I said, the stars are very prominent here because again, the commercial farmer understand these very well. Five star, it's a good ram. Four star, it's, it's, it's slightly inferior. We also publish the four key traits that we see. So that's lamb survival, days to slaughter, number of lambs born, and daughter's milk. And again, you can see how this ram ranks for each of these traits. So that's a sales catalog as it appears at the minute. So what's genomics going to do for this? First thing here, we, we've started to put this into our catalog, parentage verified. So again, the commercial farmer knows exactly what he's buying. It's exactly like um, it should be. Scrapey, still a big issue in Ireland in terms of we want to export animals to either Northern Ireland or the UK. They have to be this type one type scrapey. So again, this information is available through the DNA technology and we're publishing this on each animal. Major genes is of information, especially proliferacy and the myomax and stuff like that for certain breeds. We can put that down in the comments section here. Inbreeding as well can be down here for some of our smaller breeds. But the big benefits that we in, in Sheep Ireland or in Chaga see is that this increase in accuracy. It's not really what our stud breeders are after. They're after all these little add-ons here. But this is what we want to see, this accuracy improving. And by default, then, our rate of genetic gain improving. And we're hoping that we'll have multi-breed genomic selection up and running by the end of this year um, for our breeds in Ireland. Then just quickly to mention, as John mentioned, we are doing a bit of work with New Zealand sheep as well. So I suppose we wanted to see how do we compare with the best in the world. Um, so the first thing we wanted to do is to look at, on paper, how closely related are your indexes in New Zealand to, to our indexes in Ireland. Remember, we have a very similar system, grass-based system. The key drivers of profitability are very much the same. Number of lambs weaned, um, yo milk, all the other traits are important, carcass information. So we looked at, first of all here, was the relationship on paper between our indexes. What we found, we looked at your old dual purpose index relative to our maternal index. The correlation or the relationship between them was about 0.8. So, that's basically saying an animal that ranks well in New Zealand should perform well in Ireland or vice versa. And similarly for the terminal index. That's obviously all well and good in paper, uh, but they haven't been compared in a common environment. And we wanted to see how well does our index stack up to your index um, for the best animals. So with that in mind, we started a new flock um, in Ireland called the INZAC flock where we imported New Zealand animals uh, in 2015 and 16. So we have about 250 yews uh, that were imported from New Zealand and rams that form par part of this flock. So this is a real experimental flock. We have 180 yews um, on the ground as part of this. So these elite New Zealand genetics, they were selected mostly on dual purpose because again, we wanted to try and focus on maternal traits. There's 60 of these uh, yews as part of this trial. We're comparing them with the best we have in Ireland at the minute, so there's 60 of those yews in Ireland. We have a third group in there which we call low genetic, low Irish genetics, and you might ask why we have them in, in there. And again, it's validation for our farmers. It's to prove the principle that if you go out and you're selecting this five-star animal, you're selecting a superior animal. The breeds we use in here are Suffolk and Texel. Uh, we've kept these animals pure, just... Um, just for easiness, I suppose, to start off with. Um, and we, s we selected these two breeds because they're the breeds in common between the two countries. We could have probably brought Romney or the likes in, but we said we may as well compare like with like to start with anyway. So the objectives of this flock is to compare where we stand in Ireland relative to New Zealand. And then the second sub-objective for Ireland was to see, is our replacement index fit for purpose? Is our high animals uh, outperforming our low animals? So 
This is a very research oriented flock and we wanted to measure absolutely everything we could on these yews. So these girls are used to coming through uh, our, our yards quite a bit because we want to measure anything uh, we can on these yews to see where, if there's differences between them, where are the differences arising. So they lamb indoors, so we have lambing difficulty, survival traits, we're measuring mothering ability, we're actually milking some of the yews to see what's the milk yield um, in terms of the milk yield and the milk composition. Lambs are weighed every fortnight roughly, yews are weighed about every fortnight and body condition scored, we have health traits, we're measuring feed intake as well on these animals, we're looking how long they survive and we're also looking at fertility. So that's what we're measuring. Just in terms of results to date, we're two years into this trial, um, so it's just a quick snapshot of where we stand or where ye rank relative to us or vice versa. Scanning rate in terms of pregnancy scan, the New Zealand yews are slightly ahead. They're about 180%. Our elite Irish are back at 160%, and then our low yews fall behind. Dystocia, or number of yews that actually have to be handled um, or have a very difficult lambing, so only 2% of the New Zealand yews had to be handled, 13% of our elite Irish. Um, that wasn't unexpected, I suppose. These are very managed in very intensive conditions indoors, whereas we know these were extensively managed. If we look at some of the other key traits, lamb mortality, the lamb mortality, to, this is up until the point of weaning, it's relatively low. We would say an industry standard is 10%. We're at about 3% and 6%. The Irish are slightly better. Milk yield relatively similar between the two groups um, and then when we look at days of slaughter the performance of their lambs you can see the New Zealand lambs on average are drafted for slaughter at 150 days the Irish are slightly behind at 160 so that's showing that they're slight the New Zealand animals are growing slightly faster than the Irish but relatively we're happy that our elite Irish are performing are performing as well as the New Zealand but again we're going to follow this through for a number of years and measure lots more just to finish off very briefly then, what's our long-term strategy uh, in trying to improve uh, genetics in Ireland? What are we looking at in the future? The first thing that's coming on the horizon for us is animal welfare, driven really by the consumer and the perception they have of agriculture in Ireland. Very much linked to health, uh, lamb survival and yo survival. So again, we want to look more and more and put more and more emphasis on these traits as well to make sure we can, we can come out and show consumers we're a healthy, we're producing healthy, uh, clean, green sheep. The other thing that's coming down the road very fast in Ireland is carbon emissions. So um, as part of the EU, we have, or our government has made um, a promise that they would uh, reduce carbon or greenhouse gases by 20% by 2020. So that's only two years away and year on year, we're actually increasing uh, our, our greenhouse gas emissions mostly coming from agriculture with the expansion of the dairy industry in Ireland. It looks like we'll have fines of up to 50 million euro if we can't meet this 20% reduction. And that's very much going to come back on individual producers. Uh, so it's looking like a tax is coming down the road fast um, across dairy, beef and sheep in Ireland. So we definitely, from a genetic point of view, we need to start working hard on this greenhouse gases. Um, probably going to be linked to productivity if we can show that we can increase the productivity get lambs away to slaughter faster where well, we can show that you know our greenhouse gases can be reduced meat eating quality we haven't any research done on this but that's an area we're going to have to look at ram functionality is another area how long are these rams actually surviving in a commercial her herd or commercial flock is a big area of interest as well Difficult to measure, but it's an area that our commercial farmers are coming back to us with the whole time. They want a ram that can last, you know, four, five, six years um, on their flock. And obviously, more commercial data, the more data we can get of um, commercial farmers, the better. So just to conclude, we have large potential to increase our genetic gain in Ireland. Short term, what are we doing uh, to try and improve this? It's improving our indexes, first of all. It's genomic selection and all the add-on benefits our stud breeders can get from that and a big work, work, load of work is index validation to show that these genetically superior animals are uh, worth paying extra for. Long term we're going to focus on those difficult to measure traits 
and we have a very much an integrated industry approach in Ireland. Uh, we have lots of funding coming from our Department of Agriculture if we can make a strong enough case and we work well between ourselves and Chagas and Sheep Ireland, the equivalent of SIL like I mentioned, so very much an integrated industry approach here in Ireland. So thank you very much. So, so thanks Noreen. Um, um, a good overview there and um, it's good to see that we're at least holding our own in the New Zealand sheep. Um, we'll just take a, a few quick questions now. Um, um, is there any, any questions in specific? Alan. Hi Noreen, you mentioned about Scrapey, is that part of your genomic screening or is that a separate test? It's part of our genomic screaming, sc streaming is uh, Scrapey, to get Scrapey results as well. So that's something we're missing in New Zealand then, that you guys have got? <laughs> Good observation Alan, any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hi, Noreen. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, uh, you had a big difference there on live survival between the top Irish and the New Zealand ones. Is that more due to uh, lamb, uh, weight, birth, birth weight? Or, um, and what other, uh, what other um, things are different there? So lamb survival there, we measured it up to the point of weaning. So the big difference there was actually uh, when the lambs got out. So lambs all lambed indoors, there was very little difference in terms of lamb mortality at the point of birth, so it wasn't down to birth weight or anything. When they got out, um, it was dead in the field basically, there was more New Zealand lambs dead in the field. We did po post-mortems on some of the lambs that died to see it, was it anything in particular, there was nothing showed up, uh, there was no specific reason why more New Zealand lambs died than, than that. But like I said, compared to our national what we aim for, our target is 10% loss, so we're well below what we, we assumed we'd get. Um, so yeah, there's lots more work done on lamb survival, but lamb survival at birth is the big problem really in Ireland, not lamb survival uh, once the lambs are out in the field. My question was also about lamb survival. Um, I see the difference quite greatly in birth with dystopia, but then you had the reverse the other way round mm -hmm. after that lamb mortality. I take it that it took into account there was extra lambs born to the um, New Zealand sires and yeah, there he was hence more twins than that. But it seemed yeah. to be quite marked the other way that way. Any yeah, reason? in terms of, well, dystocia, we weren't surprised and it's very much a breed effect coming through in Ireland. So uh, our texels especially would be difficult lambing. Um, but the problems with the te texels is usually getting them out. When they're out, they live. Um, so we, we weren't surprised by the difference in dystocia there, uh, but most of those lambs that experienced dystocia didn't actually die. Um, they might have needed a bit more of a help, um, and we give them help. Um, so you know, if they need a suck for the first time, we'll, we'll help them suck, and then, um, so it, it wasn't down to dystocia really. Okay, I think um, we'd better sort of hold it there um, at the end. We're going to have a joint session, so if you've got any more questions, we're going to um, keep them for Noreen later on. So I'd li like again to thank Noreen for a very interesting presentation. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Carole Marino. From, uh, she's a principal scientist at INRA from Toulouse in France. Uh, very nice part of France and very good weather. And she's involved in uh, sheep and goat, both meat and dairy research, and she's got a particular interest in parasites and sheep. Carol. Is it okay? Yeah. And then I, um, <laughs> uh, I'm French, I'm French woman uh, with a very strong accent, a strong French accent, then sorry for this, I uh, will try to speak slowly, then you can help to understand me, and uh, I ask you to speak slowly when we, you will ask a question, thanks. 
Then um, I come from INRA. It's a research institute. Um, I come from France. It's here in Europe. And as you can see on the picture, it's more or less at the same distance than the equator. Then in the southwest of France, where I am, in Toulouse, here we have a lot of sheep, and I think it's more or less the same climate than here. Then uh, my presentation is in three parts. The first part is the presentation of my institute. The second part is about industry, breed, um, the different breed we have and the selection scheme, and the last part is about more research we have. Then firstly, my institute, then INRA, is a research institute. We have uh, several uh, research centers in uh, France, and I, um, we have almost 8,000 permanent staff, and we have uh, 13 uh, research divisions. Uh, with Rachel and Christelle, we come from the genetics department, and our lab is uh, GenFiz. This lab is about genetic physiology and the uh, breeding system. We work with two main experimental farms. We work with farmers and breeders, but also with two main experimental farms, Bourges Experimental Farm, where we have a uh, goat and uh, meat uh, sheep breed, and also the Lavage, Lafage Experimental Farm, where we have dairy use, and also meat sheep, but uh, um, permanent, permanent, well, outside all the year. <laughs> um, in my lab, we have four teams working on genetic of small ruminant. Um, the team of Guenola, where uh, they work mainly on the molecular genetics, sequencing and epigenetic and gene mutation. And my team where we work uh, on quantitative genetic modeling and genomic selection. Another team more on method. And another team with uh, Bertrand Servant where they work more on genetic gear. Then um, about uh, sheep industry in uh, France, I put uh, some information about dairy in this uh, slide after I, I speak more about sheep. Then we have uh, three main industries. The first one is meat sheep, where the most uh, interest is on lamb production. Wool is not at all uh, an interest for, for us. We, we would like to have no wool. It could be <laughs> easier. Uh, mulling, mulling, it's uh, mulling. Um, uh, when uh, wool remove uh, uh, sharing, yes. And um, the second um, industry is dairy sheep. Then the main uh, interest in on milk production and uh, lambs and dairy goat. It's mainly uh, milk uh, production. Kids is not really uh, a, a big interest in France. And we have also uh, for goat angora goat where the most interest is moer. Then um, the main production is uh, meat sheep with five, five million of ewes. Um, and, and we have, uh, but we have for this uh, uh, industry a lot of uh, breeds in France. And we work on pure breeds, not uh, cross breed. And uh, in the, the selection scheme, schemes, we have uh, 22 breeds. Then it's a lot. And in dairy sheep, um, it's a one uh, million point five use. And it's mainly four breeds. And for goat, we have one million goat with mainly two breeds, the Sonnen and the Alpine breed. Um, the for sheep production, the sheep production is mainly on mountain area and harsh environment in France. Then I will begin uh, to present you the dairy sheep selection scheme. Then um, for the five ma main breeds we have, uh, it's uh, in three parts of France. The first one is um, the Pyrenees Mountain, close to the Pyrenees Mountain. We have uh, Manesh Red and Blackface and Basco Bernard's breed. 
uh, this is this breed are used mainly to produce also irati, which is a famous 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 cheese. Sorry, with a PDO at the open level, and it's almost uh, five hundred thousand use. And uh, uh, the other main IHA is uh, in the south in this region. It's a uh, rock for IHA. The main breed is Lacon breed, and uh, it's uh, almost nine. Uh, 100,000 ewes. And we have uh, also Corsica breed uh, in the Iceland. Then uh, for each breed, we have a, um, a scheme and a program, a selection program. All are organized in a pyramidal, it's a, a, a pyramidal organization for all breeds with a selection uh, flock in the nucleus with an official uh, milk recording. It's more or less 20% of the flocks. And uh, we use extensively ovulation synchronization and animal insemination. It's uh, um, one of the uh, total of use. And progeny test and assortative meeting for more than uh, 700 rooms by year. Um, this is a more accurate description of each breed. As you can see, we have uh, three small grids and two main grids. Um, the selection criteria are uh, mainly milk yield for all the breeds. It's not uh, for the, it's only for the, the Corsica, but uh, it's implicit for uh, the other because we have uh, fat yield, protein yield, and the fat percentage and protein percentage. And uh, for Lacon breed, there is also somatic cell count and other morphology. And for uh, manage, red manage, we have also parasitism resistance, parasite resistance, sorry. Um, and it uh, uh, include uh, at the beginning of the selection scheme to select for the pre-selection of young ground. Uh, as you can see, we have 95% uh, of uh, artificial insemination in Lacon breed and less than 50% for the other breed. Um, here you can see the consequences of the selection since um, the 19, uh, 19 uh, year. Then uh, uh, you can see the evolution here. It's an example uh, on the milk yield, then it increased uh, clearly during for all the breeds. Uh, now I would like to speak about genomic selection in uh, dairy breeds. Then uh, this is uh, the classical um, breeding scheme, and as you can see, we have for it's a classical uh, selection scheme for uh, rams. And as you can see, we cannot use uh, the uh, rams before uh, two years old because uh, we have a progeny testing before. Then with genomic selection, we can select at three months a large, um, with a large base of selection and, um, and then use the rams at less than one year old. Then we win one year and have another second selection rate after progeny testing uh, in a second time around two uh, years old. Using this scheme, as you can see in this picture, we have animal genetic gain, which increased by almost 20%. Then the genetic selection begin in uh, Lacon breed in 2000, um, 16, and uh, then you can see the increase due to the genomic selection. Uh, for mid chip selection, we have uh, only a classical selection, but as I, I said before, we have one scheme by uh, breed and one evaluation by breed. Then uh, in the nucleus, um, we use uh, dam and best round to uh, create the, the male. 
and we have an on-farm evaluation uh, based on the, uh, an index uh, on the prolificacy, maternal ability, and grow. Uh, here we have a first selection in of 350 um, um, young rams for the different breed, and uh, we uh, have measure or grow. Uh, muscular development, body composition, and feed efficiency, but only on two breeds. And uh, for the uh, 15 young, uh, better, better young male, um, we have a progeny testing with maternal trait and milk, tra milk trait. And then we select five elite rams by breed. Then um, the small, the rams are used with the best of this class to create the new generation. Uh, we have some particularity in France. In fact, uh, we have a scrappy resistant of official selection program. Now, after this very hard selection, we have more than 99.99% of resistant aller in uh, our uh, selection base and um, also we manage with the gene interrogation of Texel gene um, then it's um, uh, make max here I think yeah. max yes uh, and uh, this uh, gene is not in this in the lacon breed in the meat lacon breed and we introgress this gene in this population and we work on several new traits the land survival and the early mortality, the parasitism, the flea threat, the molting, and the behavior. And um, the main limit uh, our, uh, in our scheme is uh, that 8% uh, of uh, use are officially uh, recorded on farms, and it's not a lot, a big percentage compared to the dairy, it's not a big percentage of the use. And for the moment, there are no genetic genomic selection, but uh, if the tool, the price of the tool decreases, we, uh, we have done some simulation and we could use genomic selection in meat breed also soon. Uh, now, my last part, it's about uh, the main research we perform in uh, our lab. Then first is it's about a global epigenetic mark. Um, we uh, detect, we use the LUMA method to detect this epigenetic, epigenetic mark. Our aim is to um, uh, study the genetic determinism of the global epigenetic mark. Then um, the epigenetic mark is a non-genetic uh, mutation, but just some uh, um, uh, part of the genome where we, we cannot use the information, the genetic information. Then uh, the, f the second thing was to choose a, a tissue, then we have a design to um, test the blood uh, between birth and five months, and we will also observe several tissue. Uh, we will observe in three breeds and uh, with almost 20 million divided by breed, and this work is running. Uh, waiting this result, we do some uh, first uh, analysis using blood at four months and one breed, with a large number of animals, and the, oops, the preliminary result is that uh, we um, have a variability of the epigenetic mark on the uh, total genome, and 60% uh, six, uh, of the genome have epigenetic mark, and the other uh, preliminary result is uh, we can find uh, an heritability of this trait. I think one thing is missing. Um, the last point is that uh, uh, we would like to observe the link between this global epigenetic mark and the plasticity and the robustness of animals. Then we will use uh, the same uh, data set to do this work. Um, another point is the feed efficiency. Then, um, the idea is to identify if we have the same genetic determinism with uh, using concentrate or forage food. 
then we uh, create divergent line based on uh, automatic concentrate feeder, and uh, we obtain a uh, difference between the high and low line, um, about 200 uh, grams by day. And we uh, are studying um, this line using automatic 4-H feeders. You have some picture of the feeder, it's not so clear, but... Uh, and uh, um, we would like also to observe the link uh, with the grazing estimate, but for the moment we have not a very nice tool to, to do this job. The idea is also to better understand feed efficiency. Comparing gas emission, water intake, human uh, meta metagenomics, and metabolo metablo metabolomics, and uh, also blood metabolomics. And um, um, I think it's yes. Uh, yes, I forget to give the definition of uh, residual feed intake, which is uh, feed intake after correction by go weight and back fat and muscle gas. Almost yes. Um, on the parasitism resistance, uh, we have uh, two main points. One is uh, um, research and another is in farms. And we select divergent line based on parasitism resistance uh, uh, using experimental infection in midship. And uh, the design is here. We have two successive infections and a treatment between. And we measure fetal egg count at the end of the each infection. And what we observe is uh, six times more uh, fecal egg count in the susceptible line um, than in the resistant line. Then it's a wonderful tool to study the impact of selection on uh, other disease, other traits, and also trade-off between disease and production. The other thing is we uh, use this type of design uh, in our control station in a man red managed breed, and we observe a breeding value based on this criteria, infection, experimental infection. And we when we compare the most susceptible and the more resistant lamps, you can see that we observe on the doser in on farm a large difference between the uh, doser from resistant and susceptible rams. The last point is about synergy and trade-off between resilience and production. Then we uh, consider this type of work at two levels, the gen level, with a nice example with a SOC gene mutation affecting mastitis resistance. But uh, further work show us that it's not the only, the only effect. In fact, um, the non-favorable uh, SOX mutation for mastitis have a favori favorable effect on grow and on milk production. Then we would like to know now if they, what is the type of effect on other disease and also immune response. The second point is at the biological function level. Uh, what happens during a stress, learning, meeting, or food restriction disease, food restriction or disease challenge? Uh, the most resistant animals are they always the best? Then we have uh, the perfect tool to answer. In fact, we have some divergent line on mastitis resistance, parasitism resistance, food efficiency, and milk persistency. And we have also uh, experimental farm to do large scale experiments uh, to study this type of, of thing. Then uh, all this work will be done in a future European project. This is a smarter project that will uh, begin uh, this year. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, have we got any questions for Carol? <coughs> Uh, can you just give us a simple definition of the epigenetic markers, just for the farmers here? Okay. 
um, this is um, uh, some mark on the genome. Then this mark uh, go on the gene, and and then you cannot express the gene. This mark are here to uh, uh, for the differentiation of the cell, for example, to uh, create a, a ace, sorry, uh, some cell from uh, uh, milk production or some cell for uh, growing uh, growing uh, for muscle tissue. Then uh, this is uh, some mark to uh, help to express or not some uh, gene. It's cool sketch. <laughs> it's not a gene. No, it's just uh, it's not mutation. It's not modification of the DNA. You can help me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so so it doesn't affect um, the DNA because in animals, these marks are removed when pretty much almost all of them are removed when you go to the next generation. But if an animal is, say, being very stressed, these marks come on and it affects how it reacts for the rest of its life. Exactly. But it can also be used to tell the difference between a, a muscle cell from a fat cell, yes. from a bone cell. So, but the, the marks that um, Carole is interested in are ones that are affected by the environment and they can influence how that animal responds for the rest of its life. And in humans that people are very interested because you can look at these marks and tell that a person, predict when a person's going to die and whether they smoked 20 years ago. So it actually mm -hmm. predicts performance. For many traits, yes. yes. Carol, is there any correlation between disease or parasite resistance and mastitis resistance? No. We uh, estimate the correl genetic correlation uh, using the population of Manesh, this population, and uh, we find no correlation between mastitis and parasite resistance. Moreover, in the divergent line of Rachel, we estimate the parasite resistance in divergent line, and we find nothing going on. Is the red manish, is that your most resistant sheep in France? Yes. The red manish, um, most, most resistant? I think we have a more resistant breeds, but in Pyrene Atlantic region, the um, uh, infectious pressure is very high because it's not so cold and very humid, a uh, little bit humid. like here. <laughs> and uh, then uh, we have a, a nice uh, infectious pressure. But we have some uh, breed, for example, in uh, Guadeloupe, Iceland. And here we have a more resistant breed, of course. Black belly uh, breed is more resistant. It's more resistant. Thank you. And last question for Carol. Uh, the next speaker is Gabriel from um, Uruguay. Uh, Gabriel is the director of the Beef and Sheep Research at Inya in Uruguay. Gabriel? Thank you. I am a Uruguayan man, and I have a strong accent, but Spanish, no French. <laughs> so uh, the main objective of the talk will be to present you the, the sheep breeding in Uruguay, uh, which we have now in the present, and we will program in the future. The, the first point will be a, a little introduction about the Uruguayan sheep sector, and then we will talk about the future in, in our breeding. You know Uruguay is the South America, and we have frontier only with Brazil and, and Argentina. We are not Paraguay, Paraguay is here. Uh, we have sea, Paraguay don't have any beach. 
So uh, in Uruguay, the agriculture and the livestock production is very important. Almost the 7% of the exports came from the uh, agriculture. We have a similar uh, area like, in, like New Zealand, but we have 12 million of beef cattle and six and a half, uh, around seven million of sheep. Yeah? But in the 1995, we have 20, 25 million of sheep. Yeah? The, the number of sheep declined, like in Australia, like in New Zealand, mainly in Uruguay, because the, the, the wool price came down, similar like in Australia. The uh, principal sheep breed are Corridal breed, yeah? and Australia Merino, another good breed, and the more popular meat breed is Texel. There is no dairy sheep in Uruguay, it's only a, a little number of is Christian sheep, but nobody uh, uh, milk the, the sheep. Um, in ad additional, the agriculture has a very social importance, mainly the sheep production has a very big social importance because almost 75, 80% of the farmers are familiar farmers in the way. So, um, this I will show you two map. This map is about the grass production and quality aptitude of our field. Yeah? This is the very low, the, the most power uh, fields in Uruguay, they are the best land here, yeah? and but the sheep are here, the more concentrated in the very bad land. Yeah? So here, the, uh, you can see that the main sport in Uruguay for sheep is wool, yeah? mainly gra grazy wool to China and clean wool to Europe. Yeah? Uh, we import wool too, because our uh, uh, clean wool industry is very competitive around the world. We import the wool from Australia, we import sometimes from New Zealand, we import wool from Argentina, Peru, Colombia, etc. And in the last 10 years, the meat, the lamb production increased too much and mainly was exported to Brazil. So when we compare Uruguay with New, with New Zealand, uh, I find a very interesting website. Yeah, um, they say that if Uruguay were your home instead of New Zealand, you go and they have some statistic. <laughs> <laughs> you show the, the red one are best for you, the green one are best for us, yeah, and there are some neutral uh, stuff. But I can uh, do some estimation in other statistic. For example, if you will be a, a New Zealand guy, you have 300% Less probability to be a rugby world championship because you have a very good team, the All Blacks. But on the other side, be 40, 100, more probability to be football world champion because we are uh, four-time champion in, in the world football. So there are the main breed that we have uh, genetic evaluation. The biggest one is Cordial. Yeah, All these breeds have uh, national evaluation. That means there are more than two or three flock in this breed. Yeah, and this uh, we call intraflock is only one uh, flock, like Paul Dorsa, Highlander, yeah? uh, Merino Duni, we have on, on one research flock you know, at Inya, and there are two flocks that are doing the genetic evaluation in Australia, they are connected with Australia. The Frisian flock and the Frisian flock are Inya flock. So they are the main try that are recorded per breed, they are mainly Gould cool tries, grief freeze way, clean freeze way, fiber diameter, stopper length, uh, variation coefficient of gold, uh, winning way, post winning way, early way, they are the growth traits, uh, fat uh, depth, uh, right by area, you, you use the area. 20 rate is only in Corrida. Fecal count is no mandatory tries, optional try in Merino and Corrida. And there are some subjective. Uh, Indexes like uh, like uh, ghoul in the face, yeah. You have a special score one from one to five. Maybe you have some similar and uh, pigmentation score that is subjective too. Another economic index, uh, you have three indexes for merino, three for corridor, one for Marilyn. This is a local breed, a local crossbreeding between uh, merino Rambouchet and Lincoln. And 
for pole war breed, we have uh, index two. There are more than 20 traits. In 12 breed, uh, we have uh, almost 80 flock, um, around 90, 80, 90 flock that are integrated in the genetic evaluation. The, uh, almost half of them are from Corrida. Yeah? And here you can see the develop in the last year. In the 1969, we start the first step in the genetic evaluation that was the flock testing for the wool breed, mainly for Merino and, and Corridor. And in 1984 was the first selection index in sheep that was developed by, by Raul Ponsoni that studied in, in Australia. So uh, the adoption in the last five years was, was very well in the genetic evaluation. So these are the main numbers uh, in the genetic database. There are total number of animals now and the pedigree records in each breed. So uh, we do all this genetic evaluation together with a special institution that is called Uruguayan Wool Secretariat. This is a special institution only for, for sheep that is financed by a tax from the when you export wool. Um, all the breeders have special software uh, to in, in, este, put all the data. All the data are taken by the breeders. Only the ultrasound, of, the ultrasound from River Aria and FATDEV are doing by uh, INIA technique. And all the data are uh, processed here at, at SUL or at INIA. Uh, we develop the genetic evaluation. Uh, all the genetic evaluation I uh, put in the website. In, this is the website similar like you have here. So this is the best example that we have. This is the example all from Corridal breed. This is uh, because we are uh, we have a lot of care to the different flock must be very well connected. Each of this one is a different flock. Uh, each line is a RAM than going from one flock to another one. Yeah? Uh, we control this each year. Yeah? Uh, it's the breeder's responsibility. It's no, our responsibility, the breeder must to do it. Cordial is special breed. Uh, they have a very good uh, breeder association because this is the Cordial problem and they sometimes buy one ram together, two or three breeders buy a ram in an auction and share this, this ram as very uh, teamwork. So in Korea, you have around 40,000 lamb born per year, uh, 11 years lambing in by each year in the genetic evaluation. Another very uh, more important sign that the selection goal, the selection objective, uh, were defined together with the breeder in different workshop. Each we are very pure. Uh, Breeder, uh, each breeder have a different breed association. Yeah? Uh, each breed association have a special breeding objective as it was developed together between the breeder association and the different institution like Sul and Inya. Almost the, the breeder are, are using this tool, the EPD, the breeding values estimation. And we have very good uh, genetic trend, mainly in five diameter and fecal icon for only around 10% of the breeders that are included in the genetic evaluation have fecal icon and very good uh, genetic training for body weight, clean fleece weight, uh, stop length. There are some examples here. And here I put a uh, special marketing from one stud in Merino stud that is very common now in Uruguay. When you see the newspaper or the, the, the farmer newspaper, that when this the marketing for a special auction, and they put then the uh, genetic trend. Fighting year I was, I was in Uruguay, Hubler, yeah, and Hubler tell now in New Zealand it's very often that the, the breeder put this genetic trend in the in the newspaper. We say now it's impossible in Uruguay, it's not possible, but now it's very common in Uruguay. We have this genetic trend in in our breeders too. So. The first take home message. So sheep is, uh, have a very, in Uruguay, have a very economic and social uh, importance. Genetic evaluation system is working. It's working 
very well. The selection of objective award defined at the final together with the PIDA, uh, we have good genetic plan. So, the future breeding. In Uruguay for more than 10 years, maybe 15 years, we define the different ratios in Uruguay, uh, which breed and uh, which system will be the best one. The main de definition was, was made by INIA, but other institutions uh, agree with us. And we uh, have this different tool that in the north of the country we define the will be in the uh, most, uh, in the basaltic uh, field, in the most unproductive lands, the fine gold by Australian Merino. In the other part, the gold and mid double uh, breed like Coriel, Polwar, Marilyn, and Romney. And now the more new breeds are the crossbreeding mainly prolific crossbreeding, they are pretty new, like the New Zealand Highlander, but we have a special new combination, like Finship by Ifrisia, Tex Pro, that is Texel with Finship, Coriel Pro, that is Coriel with Ifrisia and Finship, uh, Merilin Plus, that is Merilin, that is cross Uruguayan composite, with uh, Finship uh, Paul Merino. So for the merino and for the fine wool, Australian merino, the main traits, the main traits are wool production and mainly main quality. The wool quality is very important in merino. The growth, focal cone, and you have these three new traits that we are trying to do this year and start to uh, have best record this year. Famacha, you know what is Famacha? This is. Um, Subjective index that was developed in South Africa. This is because it's Fafa Malan is the name of the research and developed this. It's the Fafa Malan chart. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, subjective index for the anemia. You see the, the here is the car, the chart. You see the eyes of the sheep and they have from a special score from one to five when you have more than four or five score, you must to drench this animal, yeah? It, it was developed only for management purpose, but we try to use this like a genetic criteria too. And we are start to, to do field efficiency record and uh, greenhouse gas emission that we start this year. And tool for this development will be APD, the breeding values, and we try to introduce the genomic data in Merino. This is our main uh, priority. Here is a picture of what is the, the Merino ratio, and the main ratio is here for Merino. So in the more north so extensive system, we recommend to use the gull and meat breed and the main threat will be wool production. It's not so high the, uh, quality wool. Growth, fecal cone, and reproduction here is uh, more important. For this reason, we have twin right in Korea. And we now include FAMACHA, feed efficiency, and greenhouse emission. And the two are breeding values, and now it will be important the terminal crossbreeding. And the more new breeders are the prolific crossbreeding. Mm -hmm. The main trait will be the reproduction, growth, growth, fecal count, and wool. And because we are a wool country, in, in, say, in the prolific breed, for example, in Korea Pro, that is Korea, but we like to have a very high production of wool, a very quality production of wool, and say that is a prolific breed. Here you have some pictures of the new breed. Coriel Pro, Marilyn Plus, and Tex Pro. They are doing together with the breeder association, Coriel and Marilyn, and this is a, it's a private, uh, it's a new breed, but it's similar like Highlander. So across breeding, we use mainly Texel. Yeah? There is a Paul Dorset too, that the main two breeds now are Texel and Paul Dorset. We have Suffolk, Hampshire, and so on. But we are a wool breed, we prefer the white wool uh, terminal breed. The main traits I grow. Uh, we try to do something in carcass and meat quality. 
For this reason, we have a special central neuroprogenic testing. Uh, we develop different breeding values for for carcass well, front rack uh, weight. You know the the front rack. You say the leg uh, weight, shoulder, and she are. But we have other traits. But we are more like uh, you say research breeding values. Yeah, um, you have traits in, in, in you have record in other traits, but we uh, are public only this the first one. So we uh, I show you we have uh, some difference between New Zealand and Uruguay, but we have some something in common. Yeah, I think it was because we have a, we have a very strong genetic linkage between Uruguay and New Zealand. Some years ago. Uh, when we start in sheep genetic, uh, we have a very nice visit from Kubler, and they were a very nice course in sheep genetic, and we start, um, he would give us a very good genetic tips about the genetic evaluation and crossbreeding experiment. Too many things, I don't know really how many time it was Dorian Gerrick in Uruguay. Mainly the, Dorian was because it was same beef project, but we use Dorian too because Dorian is a sheep farmer. <laughs> use Dorian to, to, to have a very good tip in genetic. In 2006, I don't know if Sean McKeown remember that, but here was Paula Nicolini, that was a student in, in our institution uh, for a month, I think. And in 2006, we have the, the first design about the genomic research. There was, I think, the some uh, small panel from 1,500 SNP yeah, in the stem, and the next year appears the, the 50K, but it was the first uh, step in genomic. And 2012 uh, was uh, there in Uruguay, Short Nico from Lancorp, and there was a very nice textile seminar, and they have a very good relationship with the Highlander breeder in, in Uruguay. So in, in recent, Uruguay, uh, I think they need high class sheep. Uh, Uruguay is dependent of the livestock production and we need the, the best sheep in, in the world. Uh, Uruguay need a high class sheep. This high class sheep need high class sheep farmer. We are doing it, we, we take some example, maybe some of you meet some Uruguayan breeder that came to uh, New Zealand to learn and to copy something from <laughs> New Zealand, mainly our facilities. So uh, sheep need high class sheep farmer. This sheep fa farmer need high class of breeder. It's very important to, to have very good breeder association. It, this is a uh, very important social work. And here you have a picture when you have a special course for our breeders. Uh, the, the breeders demand us, we want to have a course to understand the genetic evaluation, understand so, so, uh, so it's genomic and so on. And so our breeders need high class genetic evaluation to have the more accurate, accurate selection step. And I think that INIA is working on that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gabriel. Um, <clears throat> any questions for Gabriel? None. Uh, so, Gabriel, um, you you're introducing FAMCHA, mm -hmm. and that's obviously a way of evaluating how resistant they are to homonchus, um, mm -hmm. other than just fecal egg counts. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a lot lower cost than fecal egg counts and the farmers can do it themselves. And, uh, um, what's the long-term objective? Are you trying to reduce the amount of anthelmintic treatments or just the resistance of the sheep to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah we are trying to, th the first, um, because a lot of now is uh, like fashion do famacha in, in yeah. Uruguay. A lot of breeders, a lot of producers want to do it, um, but uh, it's a very well management tool. Yeah? But on the other side, we want to include this like a genetic trait, like a new trait. 
and we're looking for the correlation between FAMACHA and fecal con. In the last week, we saw it that it's very high in Uruguay. It's 0 0.7 in Coriol, the, the, the FAMACHA and fecal con. Um, in, our, in Uruguay, the um, fecal con protocol, we have two measures after winning. It's similar like, like here. It's because we take the, the, the protocol from Australia, from here, it's similar. But maybe, but nobody want to do this protocol. When you ask the breeder what is the main trait to, to for select, always uh, people answer that is resistant against parasites. But when you ask who want to measure this in your field, nobody <laughs> responds. <laughs> um, now, we, because it's no mandatory trait, only about 10% of the people do it. Yeah, I want to have a better protocol or different protocol. Uh, I have maybe only one fecal con and two or three famacha. I include this, maybe another trial like a body weight or body condition score and to have more complex index because we select, we want to select for resistance. This, uh, something between resistance and resilience. You select for more resistant animal, but they are productive animal. Yeah, I think. Yeah. So, so Famcha in New Zealand, there's a few breeders actually using it. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, particularly from about Napier North. Mm -hmm. Is there any other questions for Gabriel? Mm. What's okay. uh, Use is no so one, and in when you have a good production, the twins are no well welcome. For many years, uh, breeders don't want twins in the in the in merino breed. But uh, we have for the uh, new breed, and when we have in the most power uh, power condition, um, around 100 percent of lambing and the best prolific breed we have 150 and the small producer have 200 percent of lambing but we are very far from from our goals yes yeah. uh, uh, most farmers um pregnancy scanning yeah is it? yeah yeah no maybe the merino no merino breeder no but uh, all the almost all the corial do it yeah and Divide the flock in twinnings and single so yeah, to, yeah. to have a better condition. Yeah. The difference between scanning and, and actual lambing percent, mm -hmm. is it predators or is it nutrition or is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 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 but uh, we have a uh, big mortality between uh, lamb, uh, lambing and weaning. M maybe the, the, the highest mortality is the first two days, yeah, mainly because the weather, yeah. But we have a lot of predators too, like foxes, dogs, no white dogs, but dogs from the neighbor, um, and people is predator too. <laughs> but the, the mainly problem is the weather. The weather. For, for for this reason, in the more prolific breed, there was included new lambing facilities that was pretty new in Uruguay, and they work very well to, to, to help you survive the land. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I was just wondering, um, your sheep numbers have dropped from 20 million to 6 million. Mm -hmm. What's been behind that? Is it lack of money in sheep, or is it the dairy industry, or yeah, yeah, it's a combination of all of that. The the, the first reason was the wool prices, 
Uh, because uh, well, there was a lot of, uh, of breeders that have the, the first income was from the wool. But there was a big competition with the dairy industry. In the, in the best field was the, with dairy. The, um, there was a, a very big uh, support from the government to trees, to tree plantation there. Forestry, yeah. for forestry. Yeah, this is another condition. In the, in, in the more rich land was the dairy <laughs> production. The most power one was the forestry and agriculture. So agriculture, mainly soya bean was uh, because the price was very high. Yeah, and the productivity of our sheep is now so high. Yeah. Okay, I think it's, thank you very much, Gabriel, for a very interesting talk. <laughs> uh, our last speaker is Thor Bitchfeld, from, uh, who's the director of uh, genetics at Norse Sow and Git, which is, translates to Norwegian Sheep and Goats. And uh, Thor is going to give us an overview of the Norwegian sheep industry and genetic improvement. If you Thank you, sir. Uh, <coughs> good afternoon, all. Um, I'm bringing Jette over there as support, and she will be more than happy to take all your tricky questions afterwards. Uh, Norway, uh, this is Europe. Norway up north, northwest. Uh, north Cape, the northern part of Norway. 71 degrees, Oslo, 60 degrees, Paris, uh, somewhere down here, 49, and if you turn the need up some down, you will be here, <laughs> more or less in Rome. So it's far north, remember that. Uh, I'll try to tell you a little bit about sheep production in Norway, about the breed, uh, uh, the sheep recording, uh, NSD, our company, the, the traits uh, that we breed for, uh, what we achieve uh, uh, with regard to genetic gain, some research and development, and then sum up what's special for Norway. Um, we are a small sheep country. We produce 25 million kilograms of meat uh, per year, 4 million kilograms of wool. We have no milking sheep. The consumption is uh, uh, 4.6 kilograms per capita per year. We are producing for the home market only. Uh, uh, just now we have uh, five to ten percent uh, overproduction, uh, and we have to hand that uh, within the country uh, because no exports are allowed. I'll tell you why later. It's the mutton that is the problem, not the lamb meat. It's hard to get uh, rid of that one. We get it sold. Uh, Sheep farmer economy. Uh, Norway is have, have a heavily subsidized agricultural sector. I think uh, we are among the three most heavily subsidized countries in the world, with Japan and Switzerland and us, I think. Um, two thirds of the income for a sheep farmer is uh, from subsidies, subsidies per animal per hectare. Uh, and we have good farmer prices Tom tried to convert uh, the Norwegian prices into New Zealand dollars, seven to eight New Zealand dollars per kilogram of carcass weight. We get five New Zealand dollars per kilogram of wool. Th that's the, what the farmer is paid. When we sell it abroad, uh, we are paid two New Zealand dollars. So the rest is subsidies again. Uh, in Norway, we have very high costs. Uh, <coughs> Because it's uh, after you find the oil, we, we, we became a rich country and uh, wage is raised and uh, everything is expensive. So uh, it's all about high costs. So even though all those subsidies, uh, uh, the net income from sheep production is low. Uh, if you have 200 years, you, you may uh, make a living more or less. If you have 300, 400, you will make a living for one person. Um, 
the structure, 12,000 sheep farmers, 700,000 ewes over the winter. Small, very small flocks. The average is uh, 55, and we have very few flocks, uh, more than 300 ewes. Of course, being uh, that far north, uh, they are, the ewes are housed during winter. And uh, depending on where you are in the south, you will house them for uh, southwest, you will house them for four, mo four months. Up north, uh, they will be housed for seven months. Summer pasture in the woods or in the mountains, that's for two or three months. And uh, 40 to 50 percent of the energy uptake uh, going into the total production is picked up on those pastures in the mountains especially. The production is very seasonal, indoor lambing only in April and May. Uh, if we count the lambs weaned per ewe mated uh, for the whole country, the total production is 1.6 and I think that's a quite good figure for a country. Um, we slaughter the lambs from August to November a, on average, age five and a half months, and then the carcass will be 19 kilograms on average. <coughs> and uh, what's special? Very intensive care during lambing time. Uh, one lost lamb is one too many, and um, I always say in, in Norway, you never lamb alone. <laughs> the, the farmer will be there more or less all the time, staying in the barn. Uh, Norway, having only 3% arable land, uh, uh, yeah, it's not an agricultural country, uh, really. So, uh, when it comes to sheep production, uh, or in other sports, some takes part in the, the, uh, the world championship, and uh, some are excellent on, on a national level. Uh, I think uh, the world championship is for you, New Zealanders. The national uh, level is for us, back home. There we are excellent. Uh, this is uh, mountain grazing, uh, rather extensive. And we let the uh, animals loose and we look for them uh, once a week and we see some of them and others we don't find, but uh, in, the, in the autumn then, in uh, early September, we really uh, intensify looking for them and uh, take them home. And we find nearly all if uh, there hasn't been predators. But um, predators are a problem. Uh, in some parts of the country. It's uh, wolverines, uh, wolves, bears, lynx. Yeah. So that is really a, a threat to the production in some areas. The breeds. This is the original uh, North European breed with this short-tailed uh, sheep. Uh, short tail, that's the spal, spal sheep. Uh, the fleece, that's a uh, dual coated wool. Uh, you have this finer wool and then uh, longer hairs. Two character wool. Uh, they are, uh, can be pulled or they can be horned. They can be white or colored. Uh, the most important uh, uh, characteristic is the flock instinct because they keep together and it's easier to find them uh, when you uh, go looking for them in the mountains. Uh, uh, the production, uh, we have three lines, and the, the, the most important line the, that has the, uh, the white fleece, and they are polled. Uh, and then we have the Norwegian white sheep, and uh, that's most of the animals, and you have uh, 10, 15 other breeds, it's only small proportions. I'll tell you a little bit more about the Norwegian white now. Long tail. Uh, Crossbred type, white, uh, just like the animals we've seen today. Uh, they are polled, uh, they are composite. Uh, in the 19th century, we imported uh, several different breeds from the UK to improve productivity of our national breed, the spal sheep. And then we formed three major Norwegian breeds. And uh, in the 70s, 1970s, again, we imported Texels to improve meatiness, and we imported finship to improve litter size, reproduction. 
And uh, in 2000, we merged all those breeds into one Norwegian white sheep. Uh, it's a, a breed for meat production and some wool production. Uh, do not uh, pay some attention to the wool production still. We use it as a pure one, uh, as we heard from Ireland, more or less. Uh, uh, we have no crossbreeding in Norway, really. Uh, it has been discussed if you should split the Norwegian white into two lines, a maternal line and a terminal line. Uh, we have decided not to do that, as for now at, at least, because the, the flocks are small and it's easy to have only one breed, manage only one breed instead of managing two breeds, one for pure breeding and, or replacements and one for, for slow, uh, lambs, uh, lambs for slaughter. Um, so it's uh, one line, but uh, the f uh, farmers, the, pro the commercial producers could pick size based on the, the uh, breeding value profiles. So they could pick uh, an animal for with fast growth or a, a sire that could give you good daughters, uh, prolific daughters, more milk. This is uh, results from the breeding flocks. Uh, 950 of them, uh, and they are, the breeding flocks are operated like commercial flocks. So there is uh, really no, very little difference between uh, a breeding flock and a commercial flock. Um, uh, lambs weaned per ewe mated, 1.8, 156 uh, days at slaughter, carcass of 21 kilograms, uh, R plus on the Europe scale. Uh, so, I think that's good. It's a highly productive breed, in my, in my point of view. Uh, oops, sorry. But the U is heavy. It would be more like 100 kilograms uh, mature weight. And they are not easy care. Definitely not. So, that's what they look like. It's an AI RAM. But they, they, they come in all uh, shapes, uh, big, small, tall, yeah. You, but in Norway, if you call them a Norwegian white, you're always uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the recording system then, uh, that's uh, quite a high figure. 48% of all use in Norway are recorded. That's uh, one of the highest figures in, uh, in the world, I would guess. Uh, they all have, all lamps have uh, individual uh, air tags, uh, electronic ones. Uh, at birth, we record dam and sire, of course, of the lamb. Uh, on, on the on the ewe, then the total embryo lamps born, live born, and the lambing ease. And lambing ease is now a code according to each lamb, not to the ewe, but to the lamb. So uh, we score e uh, each lamb. We weigh the lambs, so, uh, birth weight. We weigh them at six weeks before they go into the mountains. And we weigh them at 20 weeks when they are coming back. So weaning would be at 20 weeks, uh, early September. And then we record diseases. Uh, for example, mastitis is the mo most important one. From uh, the abattoir, we get carcass weight on all lambs slaughtered. Uh, it's very easy because of this uh, electronic air tag that's read on the abattoir. We get the Europe score uh, for confirmation of fat. And we, for the last two, three years, we have got the fleece weight of the lamb and the quality of that fleece because they are shown at the abattoir. What are we not doing in uh, Norway? We do not ultrasound uh, for uh, ultrasound scan them for meat and fat. And the reason uh, for that is that we go get all that uh, Europe information from the abattoir, so we use that information instead. Um, we did CT scanning. Uh, we, I think no Norway was very early picking up on that uh, technology uh, back in the early 1980s. Uh, and we did some CT scanning, but 
this what was not easy to uh, integrate that into a breeding scheme that, uh, that was distributed all over the country. And the, the CT scanner was at, at the university in the southern part. So that is not a part of uh, what we're doing. We are not doing fecal egg counts. We have no tradition for it. Maybe we should, but very little tradition for that. Then it's uh, over to the breeding. And let's see, that's where Jetta and I are coming from. Uh, that would be the breeding company. 80% uh, uh, of the sheep farmers are members of NSC. It's the Sheep uh, Producers Association. Uh, and breeding and uh, artificial insemination is half of the activities of what we're doing. So we are at the central level, we are responsible for the breeding program. We're doing the EBVs. We do 16 runs per year, uh, and we have to do it for four different breeds. The Norwegian white, the spal sheep, some sheviot, a very small population, and the fur sheep. We have this uh, uh, gotten sheep. Uh, on the a we have uh, now we have one AI center with 70 rams per year, and we do some research and development, and that's why we are here now. Uh, the budget uh, within the NSC is uh, three million Norwegian, no, New Zealand dollars, and half of it is from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. 20% is uh, from levy on meat, and then 30% is from the sale of AI, semen, or sale of semen. So, NSD then, the breeding plan, the EBVs, and the uh, artificial insemination. And then the, the ram circle, the farmer, the next. A RAM circle, that's a small and financially independent uh, organization or company or what we would call it. Um, and it has uh, ram breeders as, or uh, breeders as members. And they have been operating, the ram circle uh, thing has been operating for more than 50 years. Uh, breeding rams, they are owned by the ram circle and used among the uh, member flocks. The use in the ram circle, the, they are owned by the uh, breeder, the member themselves. And they are, uh, these ram circles, they are cooperating with the NSD, like Jeta and me, through some regulations, guidelines, and some financial support. Uh, if you have a test ram, uh, and you have the production you tested it, and you, it qualifies in every respect, and you get uh, 340 New Zealand dollars in support from us for that ram. So the ram circle, select rams, circulate rams, plan elite matings among the members. So then to the breeding uh, population. We have 132 ram circles. They have together, all together, 880 members and 80 8,000 use, so that would be 100 use per member. Um, and the average ram circle then would have, uh, what should it be? Uh, I'm not able to divide that one. Help me, uh, 500 now. Somebody with a calculator, uh, please uh, take that figure, divide by that one. Uh, uh, the protein testing rams, the, the test rams, they are selected within a ram circle. Uh, we test on a national scale 1,800 rams per year. 660? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, 666. Good. Uh, they would then have 10 to 12 rams in a ram circle, test uh, 10 to 12 rams. 15 maybe, um, and uh, they, those 10, 15 rams, they are selected within a ram circle. Uh, and the next year when they are tested, they keep uh, one out of five more or less, 
as an elite run. The year after, we pick AR runs from those 300 elite runs. So then we go from 300 down to 25. And they will be mainly 22 and a half years old, some three and a half year old. Uh, those runs, they are bought by NSD from the RAM circle. And uh, that is the point of no return. Uh, after they have been at the AI center, they will go to the abattoir. They are not sold into the commercial farms. They are not going back to the breeder or back to the round circle. And this is all because of biosecurity. The one round circle is not allowed to take live animals from others, from other round circles or from other breeders at all or other produ producers. So that is a closed nucleus on the top and we have 132 of them. So we pay, yeah, we have some experiences with Maddie and Scrapey and Footrot and all these things. And it's very nice to keep it uh, closed like that. Oops. Where are we here now? Back here. Um, and uh, that's a, it's a very security reason that we are not buying them in and then sending them back again because that, that would break down this compartmentalization thing. So the, the, each RAM circle depends heavily on a, the AR RAMs in their breeding work. 10% of lambs born in, ra, uh, in the RAM circles is sired by an AI RAM. Lamb slaughter, that is 5%, have an AI sire and uh, and uh, the, the other 5% is being used as replacements for use and test rams. The, the test rams over here, 85% of them will have an AI sire. And of all used lambing, 21% will have uh, an AI sire. So we depend heavily on the AI. So this is very special for Nova, I think. So maybe that's something to look at. Uh, so the key to the AI is the key to sex, we think. We have a very high selection intensity of RAMs and we, through this AI thing, we are able to get conne genetic connectedness among RAM circles. Within a RAM circles, it's no problem to be genetically connected as long as you circulate RAM RAMs among the members uh, during one mating season. But between RAM circles, it's difficult. This helps a lot. We could have been better connected. It's, it's difficult to have 132 RAM circles connected. That, that's, that's a tough job. You know, AI in Norway, 34,000 semen doses per year. Um, no synchronization, no hormone treatment. ECS detection, two to three times per day. You, you walk the RAM. Uh, in talk, entire male, put on a leech and uh, an apron so that things, and you let them mount and see if the uh, U is in estrus, and then you decide when to inseminate her. And then that should be 18 to 24 hours after the onset of estrus. We deposit the semen in the bottom of the vagina only, and that's done by the farmer. He, has, he gets one day uh, training and then he's on his own and that uh, works well. Uh, frozen semen only now, 230 million sperm cells in total per semen dose, non-return 70%. And the cost of that operation is uh, the farmer rents a shipper from us, uh, we're sending uh, the semen out in a, in a tank, uh, we, we, uh, the freight is included and if you uh, by 20 doses, the, the, the cost per semen dose would be 38 New Zealand dollars. So the, this method is uh, called a, sh a shot in the dark. So if, if you would like to remember uh, something about the uh, Norwegian AI technique, it's a shot in the dark. And that's of, uh, very often successful. <laughs> 
Uh, traits in the breeding work. Uh, the traits are down here. Uh, and the direct component of it and the paternal component. The, we have the birth weight, the heritability from point 11, and uh, the maternal part of the birth weight from uh, point 18. Uh, and then we have the six, six week weight, the 20 week weight, uh, the 22 week weight, the carcass weight then. We have the meat score and the fat score, fleece weight, fleece grade, and the litter size. Uh, what's missing here, or, or weight, is the adult ewe weight, the mature ewe weight. We are not recording, uh, that's not a part of our breeding program. And um, my fear is that the, the youth are becoming uh, gradually heavier and heavier. That is not the fear of the producers. So um, I always, in every meeting, say that, um, remember, I told you, the youth are getting heavier. Don't blame me. <laughs> uh, so we have to look into that one uh, because it has, it has a lot to do about efficiency, the, this U, uh, the U weights. Uh, litter size, uh, the heritability here is more, than, uh, more like expected. The, the, the heritability is about the meat score and fat score. They are good, please wait, like expected. Done at the abattoir. Uh, weights from the farmer himself, lowly heritable. Everything is going on, and we have one contemporary group per uh, farm per year. And um, you, know, you never know where they have been grazing or whatever. So you will have low heritabilities uh, running an operation like that. Uh, that's what we get. And on the maternal side, uh, they are. Not that low uh, as we would expect from those low heritabilities, I, I guess. So where we put the emphasis in the total merit index, nowadays it's more and more about the U traits of the, of the Norwegian white. Because we have taken care of the permular traits for a long, long time. So now the focus when uh, the, fo uh, the fox becomes gradually bigger, it turns into the maternal uh, traits. And a little bit more easy care, hopefully. Uh, so you can see here, this is the maternal ability of the mother, uh, six weeks uh, and, uh, until, uh, until slaughter, one third of the breeding goal, more or less. And then uh, we put too much emphasis at meat, so of meat score, uh, too little emphasis on, uh, on growth here, I think. We have recently introduced birth weight, and we really didn't know what to do with it. Uh, because, uh, okay, it is heritable, but could it be increased, decreased, whatever? Um, so we decided we have to have an optimum uh, trait. Uh, the light ones, they die. The heavy ones, they get stuck uh, by birth. So uh, we have we decided to uh, make it an optimum in, in the total merit index. So the, the, the rams and uh, giving uh, low birth weight here or there, they get the penalized. And the rams uh, giving high birth weight, they get penalized in the total merit index. Um, and we have done the same with litter size. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. This is the genetic gain for litter size over the last 16 years. That uh, doesn't mean that the litter size was zero in 2000. It's uh, the difference from 2000 and, uh, onwards. Um, a good increase here, a very steep increase here, and then a gradual, not that steep increase here. Because seeing that, and the farmers experienced it, uh, too many big litters. The typical litter size in the, the, the ewe lamb, one year old, that is two, that twins. And the typical litter size in an adult ewe is three. And that's enough. So uh, we have tried to flatten this out, uh, doing some, uh, something with the 
Finship gene, we call it. John could explain uh, what the gene that is later on, maybe. Uh, so enough is enough. So now we are trying to stabilize it. And we have this same way of uh, putting the uh, DBV for the litter size in the total net index, punish the ones with the low litter size, and punish the ones with the higher litter size. Uh, genetic gain for lamb growth. That is for the caucus weight. Uh, if we start here with the direct uh, uh, part of it, the lambs should be around two kilograms heavier now than they were in the year 2000. And uh, that's because of the direct effect, and then the, the maternal part should help with a 0.8 or something like that. And uh, they should weigh two and a half kilograms more when you slaughter them. They do not, but we tend to slaughter them earlier than we did before. And we don't need to keep that many uh, lambs over winter uh, to slaughter them in uh, eight months old, etc. So it definitely has improved. Uh, and the goal is still straight from the mountains to the abattoir without any grazing at home at all, without finishing them at home. Then we will hit the, uh, the market very well, get the good prices early in the autumn. Uh, some research and development. Early lamb loss, uh, dead bones and uh, losses straight after birth is important, uh, but we haven't found any heritability in it. Uh, so it's of the not looked into yet. Uh, it's still optimistic, so she will work uh, still work on it. Lamb begins for lamb, newly introduced. Lamb vigor and circling assistance we looked into it, and uh, the farmers won't record it. Uh, eat other than teeth confirmation uh, to uh, to have a little more uh, more uh, easy care uh, teeth size. That's that's what we're recording, trying to breed for smaller teeth. Mastitis. We're still looking at it, but uh, not still being able to implement it. Your longevity, of course, very economically important, hard to do something with it. And just now, e uh, eating quality, intermuscular fat, and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Genomic information, we got a project on that uh, uh, in 2017, four years, 2.5 million. Uh, New Zealand dollars. Agri research, doing the genotyping and coaching. Uh, NMBU, that's the University of Norway. Uh, they are helping out with the, the theory. And we are yet the project leader. And we will have uh, genomic EBVs from 2020, we hope. And look at this one. <laughs> Thank you, John, very much. And then uh, a little bit, uh, summing up. Uh, what's special for Norway? We have a centrally financed breeding work, and that helps a lot. Uh, we are good at recording. Uh, we have a very large breeding nucleus. I think that this is the this 88,000 that would be the largest breeding nucleus for meat sheep, at least in Europe, maybe in the whole world, for one breed. That's one breed under one management. Uh, AI important. We get uh, good gains. The breeders, look here. A strong belief in the breeding theory. I think that's uh, like uh, many of you here. Confidence in the central breeding management. So that is, uh, uh, yeah. it could be false news. It could be alternative facts out there. I don't know. Uh, we have the same breeding goal for all breeders within a breed. The total merit index is quite strict on that. Uh, you are not allowed. Uh, you to breed on meat or uh, something, one special trait, you should breed for the total merit index. We collaborate, we do not compete within a round circle, across round circles. And making results together, that's the thing that matters really. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Thor. Um, do we have any questions for Thor? Yes.
Tor, I was just interested in the, um, the subsidisation of the meat, and is it the same for the wool? The wool price you get is also subsidised by your government? Yeah. It is. Yeah. 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 It's all about subsidies. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the presentation. So what's your lambing, uh, sorry, your scanning percentage for the AI? You have 70% health, you don't use per nickel, so what percentage do you get on for scanning percentage? Uh, the scanning percentage, uh, we would expect 70% of the AI uh, used to lamb, and then we would expect um, 0 0.2 uh, la the number of lambs less than we would have with natural mating. Did that answer your question? Okay. Sorry, and on all the data that you present there is um, AI plus backup RAM, right? We have the, general, the generalities of the whole thing. We use AI for the first instance, and if they do not hold, we use a RAM for the next one. With um, over the... Uh, have you, have you considered importing other genetics to fast track your maternal improvement from other countries? Yeah, we have looked at it. We have an ev uh, even imported New Zealand Romneys. Yeah. Two, <laughs> two rams through, through uh, Wales, uh, south, the southern part of England, because they were trying to have easy care there and we got in touch with them with uh, Ian McDougall. You may know that uh, Australian vet. Um, and then they, were, they were, didn't grow fast enough. They were too small. So uh, the farmers very soon lost interest in them. I think so. Are you going to introduce new efficiency with weighing the adult sheep. We should do that. Or uh, try to at least restrict the increase in due weight and maybe have some efficiency figures too. But uh, then you need the records. The breeders need <laughs> to weigh the use and that, that's a problem. Uh, should we condition score? At the moment, um, New Zealand is just taking the actual weight. But yeah. There's quite a few there encouraging us to do condition score as well. What's the correlation between condition score and the weight? I wouldn't know, uh, but um, we would try to weigh them uh, early in early pregnancy, uh, hoping that they have been uh, the, 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 the leanest ones uh, by weaning would, would have recovered, so they have more or less the same conditions for all of them, hopefully. But we are, we are feeding them inside, so we, are, we have the possibility of adjust, adjusting uh, bo uh, body condition scores more than you have. So, so Thor, given the background of these sheep and what they look like, yep. how much different do they look from New Zealand sheep? Uh, they look quite different from the Romneys we have seen, of course. Yeah. But they look very much like the, the Texel, Suffolk, uh, Charolais uh, seen today, etc. So. Right, um, have we got any, a last question? Yes. Just one observation, Thor, when you're talking about adult use size, it's interesting because you've probably got a very closely intensive inside managed system compared with all our other systems that are fed more extensively outside. It may be as simple as the, um, you know, the feed levels. I mean, I think we might sit here and think, um, that's a heavy ewe, but maybe a lot of our sheep that were fed under the same regime might display the same characteristics on adult okay. body size, yeah. just an observation. Hmm. Yeah, because they put on weight, if they are fed uh, good silage ad lib during the winter, they put on weight and they grow, for, grow a lot. Uh, having having them um, uh, lamb as a one year old, having twins, that uh, decreases the adult weight that holds them back. <laughs> okay.
If there's uh, no more questions, I'd just like to thank Thor again for a very interesting presentation and particularly the contrast with the AI between Norway and France and Uruguay and New Zealand. Thank, thank you, you, Thor. So now I've got the an enviable task of um, just quickly summarising the New Zealand system and I'm not going to dwell too long on this. I um, just uh, want to say that, um, that Beef and Lamb New Zealand Genetics um, is similarly structured and obviously does uh, genetic evaluations but it's also running progeny tests and R&D projects. So reasonably similar there to what we've heard. A little bit of history. Once again, we're starting in the 19, late 1960s for uh, recording schemes. Um, big change uh, about 18 years, 19 years ago with the introduction of animal model BLUP. Um, DNA parentage around 2002, which is probably a lot earlier than most other countries. Central progeny test, probably the same as many other countries. Genomic selection, we possibly started earlier than others. Um, I'm not sure um, the, about the adoption rate there though. Um, next gen flocks, which are many cases similar to some of the overseas evaluations, uh, particularly uh, Ireland. Um, and we've got, I'll call it Genomic Selection Plus, which is the beta test that's going on now. And we have probably some very similar traits that have been introduced over the last 20 or 30 years. Facial, facial eczema, which is uh, an issue in New Zealand, although Norway and Scotland have similar toxology problems at certain times of the year. Fecal egg count has been given a pretty strong uh, plus throughout this meeting and it wasn't me pushing it, I just want to say that. Um, DAGs, it's interesting to see that DAGs is creeping into many of the evaluations around the world uh, and meat quality has certainly uh, been there many times. Um, we, of the talks today, we probably have one of the higher number of uh, breeding use but I think that the general trend has been very similar across um, the various countries. Uh, with a, Obviously as far as breeds go, we've got uh, a strong leading contender in Romneys, but there is quite a bit of composite influence because to me a parent Allen and a Coopworth is a composite as well. Um, decision making flow in the sheep, um, we've heard a lot about breeding objectives and how they've been uh, constructed in various countries and for most of the countries that we've been talked about today, they are economically based. Um, find like-minded breeders, well we've certainly heard quite a lot about how the breed societies and the breeding groups work together today. Um, and um, also some of the tools that are available. I would have to say that um, in some countries, particularly countries where EID is a requirement, there seems to be a lot more commercial data in their evaluations. Um, once again, uh, terminal and maternal indexes. I think that our um, goal trait groups is uh, an emphasis that uh, occurs in so, uh, several other countries but we seem to have made very good use of it. And um, we have a variety of tailored indexes and there seems to be quite a bit of variation depending on what country you come from overseas. Uh, finally, um, we've seen plenty of genetic trends graphs um, and we are making um, 
reasonable uh, genetic progress um, uh, uh, on an economically based index. And um, if you're, you put on your squinty eyes, you can see that um, it sort of picked up after BLUP was introduced. It picked up again after the CPT was introduced here. And, um, I, and I am absolutely sure now that we're doing enough animals on, on SNP chips from this year onwards that the future rate of progress is going to be quite steep as well. So, for in New Zealand, um, I think everybody has slightly different ideas about the challenges that we've got, but I think everybody would agree, including Michael Lee, we are every hiding in the audience uh, over there, that single step genomic evaluations is a challenge over the next immediate year or two. Um, we've heard a common trait of methane, feed intake, disease and welfare as themes coming through that we need to concentrate on and I certainly think that that's the case in New Zealand. Um, I think that we can make a lot of improvements on on-farm data capture and recording individual animals while they're at grazing. There's a lot of data that hasn't been caught there in the minute. Um, we definitely could make a lot more progress if we could get some off-farm data capture of commercial animals traced back um, and full-scale traceability to marketing and DNA auditing, auditing is probably going to be a requirement for some of our overseas markets, particularly in Asia in future. Um, the one that isn't on here but is on here, which is on-farm data capture, DNA and new measurements is actually the methylation work that Carol was talking about, trying to use the, uh, the samples that we already get, but extract more information from them. So with that, that's my summary. I understand that the objective now is to have just general questions from the audience on, uh, uh, for any country, um, or, or on any related topic. So, thank you. Are there any questions for John before we um, move on? Yeah. Ooh, yeah Alan. Do the hot Alan. Be gentle on me, Alan. G'day, John. <laughs> John, we've got some scienti scientists from, from um, sheep breeding countries here. We're all doing our own wee things. Is there any work to try and get a level playing field between the countries on genetic? Um, improvement or uh, evaluation because we're, you know we're all trying to do the same thing now we're all going in the same direction can we speed that up working together it's it's a good question um, there's some limitations in technology and there's some limitations of the genetic connectedness between countries um, I'll start with something that will possibly have less interest to the audience there's a lot of lacoon milk, dairy milk sheep been bought into New Zealand very recently. And so I think that there's an opportunity there to do joint French New Zealand evaluations for dairy sheep milk uh, breeds. Um, well, what, what, what's going to be called? Southern Cross, I think, is our new dairy sheep breed, isn't it? Um, so that's an example. Um, in theory, genomics can tell us how different our breeds are and whether we can combine that information. Um, in Ireland um, and possibly Norway, the breed composition, if you look at the sheep, we're, 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 we're looking at the external component of the DNA, is possibly similar enough in Ireland and Texels and Suffolk, and then the Norwegian white sheep could be basically a Teflon in a wolf's clothing. Um, um, so, so those are definitely areas to investigate. Uh, and similarly in Uruguay, there's some opportunities there as well. I think one of the things that we can definitely do is develop new traits and new recording systems. So even if we can't do common genetic evaluations, we we um, 
get better bang for a buck for the limited research dollars that we have by collaborating because we've got to realise that the competition isn't a sheep breeder in Uruguay or a, a dairy sheep um, breeder in France. It's actually the chicken and the pork uh, and, the uh, and the dairy cattle industries and possibly the Pinus radiata industry that are, will, will try to wipe us off the map. And the fake meat, of course. It's What's coming. that? The fake meat, it's coming. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. It's not as simple as just getting eight, um, straws from all the countries and bring them to a central spot and evaluating. Oh, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> Julia can answer that. <laughs> yes, I can answer that, Alan. We actually need MPI to talk some sense first because you may know that at the moment we can export live animals to the other side or to the EU, for example, but we cannot export semen to the EU because of the biosecurity rules. We can bring anything back from the other side, or semen and embryos at least, back from the other side, but we can't send in that direction. So it does kind of limit the opportunities for connectedness. Any other questions for John? So, so in regards to collaboration, we, we have been talking with Australia, which is probably noticeably meet, missing in this meeting, but you know, potentially around the, you know, uh, sharing resources like uh, genomic information and maybe design of SNP chips and things like that. So, so there are discussions, um, but you know, casting the word wider to the uh, EU and, and uh, Central and South America would probably be prudent as well. Is there any other questions? But well, I'll get you have a chance to stand up, and I'll get my um, the speakers to come up to the front here. Would that be the best way to go? Yep. And so can we stand up and we refresh while we get our speakers assembled? Yep. And I'll take this off.
could just get you to take your seats and we'll do the panel. Come on up, yep. Yeah, I'm out of the way. You're in the front and centre. I, I did the mistake of letting you stand up, right? So, no, it's good to fish in. Yeah. Come on up, yeah. Noreen will be in. <laughs> You'll be at the front too, John. So I'll do the runner again, but you'll do the intro. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, um, we've all stood up and stretched the legs and we've got our yeah. panel of speakers up here. So I'd just like, is there any general questions to start? Um, um, that people, you know, this is particularly as, as it's relative to the New Zealand sheep breeding scene here. Any, any particular questions? Perspective, what you see as a main priority for your region or country? You want to hear that? Main, main priority right now for each regional country is. To get the genomics up and running, to handle more difficult traits afterwards. So yeah, from a breeding point of view, it's probably the same thing, get genomics. Uh, from an industry point of view, it's get a good deal from Brexit. Uh, we're very highly reliant on Brexit. 60% of our sheep go to the UK market, so if we lose that in the morning, we'll be in big trouble. Uh, for us, it depends on of the uh, industry, because in for milk industry, we have genomic prediction, then it's to use the added progress to select new traits and uh, mainly it's uh, adaptation traits and robustness traits. And for meat sheep is to begin uh, with genomic selection and to have a lower price for sheep in order to begin. Yeah, for uh, Uruguay now, the, the first priority is gain the world championship football. <laughs> 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 and the, the second one in sheep production is maybe a similar. There Different tribe, but we want to have more robust sheep, mainly in Merino with uh, good, very good, good quality and good quantity. In the other breed, uh, best uh, uh, prolificity, best uh, winning percentage, and uh, meat, meat growth and meat quality. Yeah, but uh, the resistance against parasites is one of the first tribes in Uruguay. Could, could I ask all the sorry all the um, participants here what's happening with animal welfare in your countries and and what sort of constraints are they going to be placing on the sheep industry uh, particularly tailing and, and, and all castration all those things shearing <coughs> we do not do docking we do not castrate so uh, in Norway uh, Sheep farming uh, is considered uh, very unfriendly, uh, the way we uh, run our production. So animal welfare is not a, a very big issue at all. Uh, maybe the greenhouse gas emissions can be an issue for uh, old ruminants. So we have to keep, <laughs> keep watch out for that one. Um, so in terms of tailing, um, the only thing we're allowed to use now is a, is a rubber band rather than you know, a hot iron or a knife um, to be part of what we call our board B scheme, which is basically our body which helps to generate new markets for lambs. So they're very much in the case that we need to, we need to use these rubber bands. Castration is not an issue at the minute. The other big issue um, for some of the some of the big uh, food markets that are looking to buy in Ireland is lameness really, lameness and fly strikes. So when they come to audit farmers, they don't want to see a sheep on its knees. So they're the welfare issues that we, we're facing anyway. Yeah, so welfare groups, pressure groups, are 
by having an impact on you, or is it? Not really, not not so much yet in Ireland. Um, a lot of the Irish population is one generation away from farming, so you know we're we're not at that stage. We're not like the UK yet. A lot of people are still tied to the land, so it's not a major issue yet. Um, I think in France, uh, um, the main concern is we co we study the behavior of land, um, um, the welfare of land, and increasing the behavior um, of um, youth during uh, to um, look after the lambs. This is the main train selection. And uh, after, I think, in the society point of view, um, I, um, I think they want to put, uh, again, animal outside. Then because for the society point of view, it's uh, better for animals. And I think this is the main concern about the view is to put animal outside. So in Uruguay, the welfare is a very important use. Uh, we have a new guideline for have very welfare uh, application. They are similar like you have on Australia. We are in the same group with Australia, New Zealand, and other countries. Then you have this new guideline, and we want to have a new like welfare stamp. When, because uh, all our products are for export, or almost also are for export, and mainly for good production, to, to export to, to Europe, to have a welfare stamp certificate that we'll be doing in, in Uruguay. We have um, some problems sometimes with the PETA uh, association, like it was in, in Argentina, in the south, in Patagonia, uh, that are they start by the wool production. Uh, some Problems are very routinely in Argentina or in Uruguay. There are no against welfare, but we take a picture uh, with bad intention must, must be a, a problem. But uh, it's a very important issue for us. Yeah. I think I forget the main concern about, it's not directly uh, the welfare of sheep, but uh, it's the use of hormones for uh, synchronization. It's uh, the main uh, concern in France today because uh, the hormone comes from uh, horses and the welfare of horses is... Uh, and uh, we try to find some other solution because it's a very important question at, the mom at this moment. Yeah, just a question to Gabrielle. Is um, your Uruguayan system subsidized at all? And I ask this question because when I look at the contributors from France and Ireland and Norway, it seems from what I know you have countries that the urban population actually values the, um, the rural population and what they can contribute to maintaining the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, we're sort of faced with a, a problem in New Zealand where we've sort of lost that engagement from our urban counterparts and um, you know, so much of what we're doing is production, purely production orientated and I'm just wondering what the system is in Uruguay. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, no, it's not subsidized at all in, in Uruguay. Um, but we have, for example, the breeders must pay to be included in the genetic evaluation. No, it's not for free. And this must pay to do the, the all the registration, the, the registration, but they must pay to do the institution, the zoo institution that do it, the, the evaluation. Uh, but uh, for the Ministry, agriculture ministry, it's very important to keep the people at, in the countryside because o we are only three, three and a half million people in Uruguay and mainly about 90, 95% of the people live in Montevideo, in, live in the cities, mainly of those in Montevideo. Uh, but they, are keep, they have only a uh, very low amount of money for the, to have a special project to keep the people in, in, in the country, but it's some uh, consulting service on some finance, uh, small like uh, uh, credit or financial for to to buy some infrastructure or some animals, or but it's not directly subsidies. No.
Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably yes, and and just lamb consumption in general um, is going down massively in Europe, which is our main market. Not very it's increased in France, but uh, synthetic meat, ah, organic. I understand organic, <laughs> synthetic. No, <laughs> no. Yeah, we all have uh, some discussion in our team about this synthetic meat. Uh, I know that for, for us now it's no uh, uh, problem, uh, but um, people know. I never try a barbecue from the synthetic meat. Uh, I think that we, we prefer the Uruguayan meat in a very good barbecue <laughs> than the synthetic meat. But I know uh, people are wrong. <laughs> I think the lamb it has to be placed on the, 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 the high quality uh, shelf. And then it, I don't think the synthetic meat will uh, compete. Uh, maybe that will wipe out the chickens or whatever. That doesn't matter. So we have to keep the lamb up there. Uh, it, it has that position in Norway now. It's uh, well uh, recognized by the chefs and all that. And it has to stay there. And then it's not a problem. I agree. <laughs> any, any other sort of general areas, um, perhaps from a breeder perspective? Um, you know, perhaps there's some issues that um, you would like to see addressed. One of one of the ones. Oh. Uh, uh, I'm very much into population size, the breeding population size. Uh, so I told you we have one breed, one breeding goal, uh, close to 90,000 ewes operated under one management, more or less. Um, if you are getting ahead, if you are successful, a successful breeder, a su successful group, you should not buy in anything anymore because then you, uh, every, time, every time you buy in, you fall back. You, l you lose your competitive advantage. Then you, sh you have to have a population that's big enough to, uh, mo uh, to uh, take care of the inbreeding to, uh, at the same time. With 90,000, it's no problem. But in the spell sheep, we are running it the same way. There we have 12,000, and we do use the AI the same way. There we have inbreeding problems because we are not able to get the genetics from anywhere. And with the six, seven AR rams, so every third year, that's a 20 rams per generation. Tough. So what do you do with your rather small populations in many countries uh, to handle inbreeding and be stay in the top? Does anybody want to? Answer that. Um, we'll start with the um, other countries. Who's got the most breeds? It's probably France or Ireland, isn't it, with the small populations? So perhaps I'll hand it over here and let somebody else pick it up. <laughs> yeah, so we would have a very small breed there. Belclair breed only has a population of 800 yews. It is a composite breed, I suppose, so we're starting out with quite a wide uh, base, but it is, has been narrowing. Uh, dramatically in the last number of years. So similar to what was said with the computer, we have an inbreeding report. So a uh, farmer has a list of all his yews and all the options of the rams he goes before he goes to buy. And it basically color codes green, uh, amber, red. And so he can make a sele selection decision based on the rams he wants and then also based on the inbreeding. Uh, within the selection scheme, um, we the, the farmer cannot uh, decide the rams to use. Then we can decide to use the best rams, including inbreeding configuration. And uh, uh, for very small breeds, there is some inbreeding uh, value to manage a very small breed without breeding scheme. 
we calculate in, in, in various amelie for our selection nucleus. You do something similar, like you say. But uh, in some breeder have in the old fashioned breeders, seeing that inbreeding is a good thing because it's taking for them, maybe for the maize, in the corn inbreeding or the plant inbreeding. As some, in, because the, the breed start when you inbreed something, you know, because the breed must be something in common. Uh, there is some inbreeding in the breed because uh, there is a breed. <laughs> but uh, some old fashioned breeder want to have inbreeding, yeah, because when you are more focused to show and not for production. When you are more focused for show, they have the best ram in the world and they have to be a clone of the ram for uh, forever and ever. Yeah, this is sometimes a problem in the old fashioned breeding. I do not feel confident that you have uh, got the grip of this because um, this is population. It's not, it's not the individual animals that, that uh, avoid close inbreeding in a, in a breeding herd or whatever. You should really select hard, and the genomics will help you, but it will not help you with inbreeding. Uh, no, it does not. Uh, John, hopefully I'm correct. Will genomics uh, bring inbreeding up or down? Selecting stronger and stronger. Um, in, in theory, there was an experiment done. If you use genomics, it should slow inbreeding because you should be using more distantly related animals. In practice, that didn't work out. It was about the same, but you made more genetic progress. Um, you can use mate allocation programs like everybody's using. Um, that helps in the short term, but in the long term, it doesn't. Then, of course, there's the Kiwi solution. You just cross everything. <laughs> <laughs> and that puts the problem off to the next generation. <laughs> but the trouble is, is that, uh, and I think this probably shows up, is, is, is Norway's doing the same thing, and they've basically come to the same sort of sheep. Right, so at some point, that's got to stop. No, in, um, in New Zealand, with this, we've all been encouraged to um, cross flock and get our connectedness um, right up there. Is it not um, increasing the rate of inbreeding eventually, and eventually we will all end up in the same hole, whether that be a good hole or a bad hole? Well, hopefully it's going to be a good hole, and hopefully it's going to be a long time away by, by, by essentially... Um, using the best rams across flocks. I made my point. <laughs> I think uh, better genet genetic connectedness can help you in the long run because you're not, well, especially in the case of Ireland, you're not tied to an individual breed then because you can connect across breeds. So you no longer have to select within breed, you can select across all breeds. So, What if it's uh, stud flocks, pure breeds? Again, it should help you. Well, in the Irish point of view, it should help you because they are all connected to each other, so you can make sure that you're selecting the best within the entire population. If your flocks aren't connected, you're only linked to probably a central hub, so you can only really be confident in genetics within that central hub, whereas increasing your connectedness gives you a wider range, or a more diverse range of rams to select from. Yeah, on a short, yeah. Um, for example, in, in Uruguay, in, for example, the Corial breed, they use the tool that is the genetic evaluation across flock very well, yeah? because they really find when they find the best ram in other flock, then buy it and use it because they have they have no problem to use the ram from another breeder. But for example, Merino breeders, they have another mentality. Yeah, uh, they don't use the ram for another breeder. They prefer to buy some ram in Australia and <laughs> buy it and use it than buy a, uh, a ram 50 or 100 kilometers along. Yeah, they, they you, you use the cross evaluation in the paper, but no in the real life. They use only intra flock selection.
I would I would like to ask a question from both the audience and the other uh, participants from the other countries about um, how much um, data you get from the commercial breeding populations and what's the key hurdles that you had to get across to capture that data? We have access to at least 100% uh, more data than we use because we only use the data in the, in the, in the breeding herds, uh, the 88,000, and we could get hold of 100,000 uh, more use if you like. But the genetic links are not too well, so uh, it's, uh, it's hard to utilize that in small herds. Uh, so we don't, do not really rely on that information in the, in the, in the breeding value estimation. But you've got access to all the pill data for all the animals? Yes, we have if we like. Mm. We don't, yeah. They we produce EBVs for all flocks, but uh, they are much more reliable in the breeding uh, flocks than they are there on, on the level below. So commercial data is of key importance to us. We'd love to get triple more data of it in. Um, the good thing about Ireland is we have EID. Uh, it's mandatory in all our yos, so we have a very easy system to record data. There's handhelds, um, you know, there's all the scanners. Um, but the big hurdle, I suppose, at the minute for us is parentage. So a lot of commercial breeders want to get into the scheme, but it's just, it's single, it's the bother of single sire mating and matching the yo to the lamb at birth. Um, so we want to get a parentage only uh, DNA technology that costs maybe five dollars or below um, to try and get them in. To five, if we could, five dollars, I think. Um, and it would also bring. <laughs> <laughs> if we could, um, if we could crack that, we could also crack recording on the hill, um, because in Ireland the hill um, is underrepresented in our genetic indexes at the minute. Um, we have a database, uh, on we have a special um, ACO, no, it's not in English, <laughs> agreement, <laughs> thank you. We have special agreement with uh, breeders, then all the data inside the selection uh, scheme in the nucleus are available for us, um, phenotyping and genotyping, and pedigree, of course. Um, now we have some new negotiation, but um, it will be the same in the future. But outside the nucleus, it's more difficult, and particularly um, the health data outside the, uh, the selection scheme is not available and it's public, then it's a bad luck because they are not very good connection. We have the farm, but not exactly the number of animals and it's difficult to study new disease. Yeah, no, because uh, all the data came from the commercial flocks. We have only one nucleus, uh, one merino nucleus that we use that uh, like a selection nucleus, uh, information nucleus that they record another trait for example, the, the feed intake trial will be recorded, that, but other data are from the breeder association, and the pedigree data from pedigree animals come from the National Breeder Association, um, but we have uh, like two pedigree, the, for the official pedigree data and the for no pedigree data, that we record by uh, uh, the, the producer myself. Um, all the data are available for, for, for INIA, for, for so. <laughs> so, yeah, it's probably getting time. People are wanting to be on their way home. So, the next one, if there is one, will be the final question. Um, so, is there any any final questions? Yes. Um, it just mentioned up there earlier today about the environmental effects of sheep farming and methane production and all that. Uh, we've got a new government in New Zealand who's basically sort of stated they want less animals and more trees. 
uh, because of the effect that animals have on the environment. Um, these issues in your countries uh, with global warming and greenhouse gases and all that. <coughs> well, agriculture has just recently appeared, so we don't have any high pressure on the agriculture sector or uh, the ruminants yet. I think that there will be some. So we have to look into it. We cannot just say uh, that's not for us to, to deal with. Uh, so we're looking into it, but not very worried uh, at the moment. Yeah, so we're very worried. Um, we're similar, I suppose, to New Zealand. 85% of the methane emission comes from agriculture in Ireland. Um, it's looking, uh, you know, there was a, there was a, citizen assembly in Ireland and they voted on it before Christmas, should we tax farmers? And the majority, 90% of the citizens said yes. So we're likely to see a tax coming down the road um, on probably overall production, which is pretty unfair, but th that's the way it's looked like it'll come and it'll come very soon, I think, for us. Um, for us, it's the beginning. We have some work at the research level on gas emission, but uh, for the moment, it's not uh, a priority for breeders and farmers. Yeah, you know, because it's no a priority for the breeder because we are starting the, the first stage to, to to measure it, but it's a priority for for the country. The the country is seeing that uh, some Paris agreement yeah. too, and in 2025 or 2030 it must to reduce uh, I don't know 20 or 25 percent the, the emission or the intensity of the mission, it will be better for us. Because when you increase the productivity, we can uh, decrease the, the intensity. Yeah, but it's a main issue in beef cattle than uh, in sheep. We, we will work in sheep too, but beef cattle is more important for, for us. But um, almost the biggest project in the agriculture ministry are about the climatic change and emission, uh, there are a lot of money around the world to, to, to do it. It's a very important issue for us. Okay, uh, thank you. And I think we should um, uh, wrap up uh, at this point. And before we thank all the speakers, uh, at least one person's asked me about the country of representations here. And I think that what I wanted uh, in this was to get enough countries to see the common themes. Uh, at one stage, there have been probably several more countries, but that didn't come to pass due to animal and um, human health issues and other things. But um, what has surprised me is the commonality of the problems and the methods that they're being approached around the world at the minute. And I think that should offer some opportunities. So I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank our speakers today. I think we're very lucky that uh, they've, we've managed to wrangle them down here to the country music capital of New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>